so uh, the experiments clearly show what it is not, <laughs> which doesn't help us at all. We're looking for the description. What is the description between incoming and refracted light? We know they are not equal. All three of our demonstrations showed this. And if this were a senior level optics course, I would prove it to you what the relation is. Um, as it is not, I will just tell you the answer. Here is how this works. It took people a long time to figure this out, by the way. Everybody knew light bent when it went through a medium. But how those angles were related, it took people a long time to figure out. Snell figured it out first. He gets the name. Snell's Law. Yeah, here's what it is. N1 plus sine of theta 1 equals N2 sine of theta 2. It's actually a pretty simple relation once you know what it is. Now you might should be asking, okay, I know what theta 1 and theta 2 is. That's your in and out. I know what the sine function does. That's good. What is this N1 and N2 all about? Okay. Well, if you remember, we talked about this last week. Why is it that light bends when it enters a medium? Yes, but why? It's traveling through a different medium. What does it do when it goes into a different medium? Did you say that? So here's what we're going to do for this lab. Um, I'm going to take all six of these sheets that we did, and I'll scan them and email them to you, so you both have copies of it. Okay. And um, it's already drawn out on the first part, for the reflected part, that theta i equals theta o. But for this one, I want you to find what is n for the material. Okay. Remember, two of them were made out of what? Plastic. Plastic, acrylic, whatever you want to call it. The third one was made out of? Glass. Glass. So they're going to be a little bit different. Pretty close, but pretty still. We should different. probably label them so we know which is which. And so I want you to find out what is the N. Uh, and this, by the way, would be N2, the set, the stuff that it went into. Okay. It, what started out, the light started out in air. So you need to know what is the N of air. Well. I'll tell you, N for air is 1.0004, almost 1. Most books just say it's 1. And it has no units? No, nope, it's an index. So if you look at the definition, remember this is the units here. This is meters per second, and this is meters per second. So meters per second divided by meters per second goes away. So it's just a number, there's no units at all. Yes. Uh, I want you to find the index of 
refraction from each. And since we did two of them in acrylic, uh, it should give us a pretty good, um, we should get the same N for both of those trials, because it was the same piece of plastic, right? So if this law is true, then that N should be the same value for both of those trials. Okay. If this law is not true, then we'll get two different N values. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Okay, so that's your lab. And now we need to move on to the rest of the chapter. So this this by the way is the two big pieces of the chapter, the law of reflection and Snell's law. So the two giant pieces of the chapter. And this one. This one works for anything that reflects, by the way. So not only does it work for light, but it also works in things like balls bouncing. Okay? So if you throw a ball, angle down at the floor, it's going to bounce back up. That's a reflection. The angle that it comes in is going to be the angle it bounces out. Okay? Uh, it all works in billiards. Hanging out of the pool hall. Uh, you know, stuff like that. Okay? So bouncing, it's all like shape. Was that a ricochet? Ricochet. Yeah. Uh, now, we move to the rest of the fun stuff. So, oh, thank you. Forgot. There's a third question here. Why is there a gap? Why is there a gap? Well, to answer that question, what's that? You want to yes, that's part of your lab. Looking at this mirror that we used, of what is this mirror composed? Look at it from the side. Glass. And what? Blue. Blue. <laughs> what is this mirror composed of? Glass. And metal. So here's the thing. It is indeed a chunk of glass on top. And underneath is a very thin coating. In the old days, it used to be pure silver. That's kind of expensive. They usually use some sort of nickel plating or something like that now. Um, this particular one has a piece of plastic over it to coat that nickel plating. Uh, so notice what has to happen here. The light has to first hit the glass. What does light do when it hits glass? Refracts. And then it went through to the other side, and then what did it do when it hit the nickel? It bounced. That's when it reflected. So it reflected at the nickel on the other side of the glass. So if I were to draw this real thick on the board, I drew it like this to kind of show you the problem. But what's actually going on here, the light comes in. As soon as it hits the glass, it refracts and goes all the way to the nickel. Then it reflects back to there and then refracts again back out. So it actually, it looks to us like it goes here but it doesn't. It actually refracts. It goes all the way to the bottom and back out. Okay, does that answer your question? So straight lines can't account for refraction. Okay, so now we're going to deal with two special cases. Okay, so you understand the two principles, right? Reflection, refraction. Straightforward, right? Okay. Now we're going to take those ideas of mirrors that are big and flat and bend them. Like this. And all of a sudden, everything gets bizarre. Okay? And uh, so, this is kind of fun. When you look at this mirror up close, what do you see? Just you. Just normal? normal? <clears throat> well, you just look really. So it's you but bigger, right? Yeah. Okay, now as I back up, what happens to you? I invert. Tell me the point at which you invert. Okay. Now, sort of like it's halfway. Like, like right blurry. here, you're kind of blurry, yeah. messed up. And then what happens? No, it's just me upside down. Now it's you upside down and? Small. Smaller. Okay, I'm going to do this for the camera's sake. Okay. Up close, you can actually see Sarah in the background. Stay there, Sarah. And then as I back away, at some point it should flip. It's really about flipped by now. And now it's going to 
flip and should be completely upside down, but smaller. Okay. There's you big. And here, tell me when you flip. Oh, I already did. Yes, okay. And now you're you, but upside down, small, right? That does your head. It does. So, uh, this, uh, you asked the question earlier, is this a spherical mirror or a parabolic mirror? Parabolic mirrors are very expensive. Okay, this is a spherical mirror. <laughs> Please don't break it just because it's not very expensive. <laughs> but, uh, nonetheless, it is still kind of expensive to make a curved piece of glass. Um, parabolic mirrors are very expensive. We do have some parabolic mirrors, um, but as I already said, they're very expensive. Them out to just play with them. How expensive? Um, I've got some cheap ones that are around three hundred dollars each, and I've got a couple really nice ones that are around five grand. What? What do you use that for? I use those for astronomy on uh, the bottom of a telescope. Wow. Uh, so how does this work? There's a lot of math for this. A lot of math. For this class, you don't have to deal with it. Aren't you happy? Mr. Wiley, his wisdom in making this textbook said these poor students, they don't need to know the math for this. I believe them. So you don't have to know the math for this. <sighs> class, you have to wait to college to learn the math for this. In the meantime, however, you can still get the answers through this method called ray tracing. setting on the computer and there's a setting on this. Uh, I usually play with this for quite a while. Uh, but okay. Ah, 
Maybe this one I'm looking for. Oh, this one. Yes, JG. Yay, ray chasing, okay. Whew. Here's the rules with ray chasing. You must always use a ruler, a protractor, and a compass. Do you have such items at your home? That's a question because compass means two things. It could mean either the little magnetic deal that always points north, or it could mean this kind of compass. This is the kind that I'm referring to. This is a compass. You can adjust the angle. Okay. If you do not have a compass, which not everybody does, but everybody usually has a ruler and protractor, right? A ruler and protractor? I think so. Yes? I think so. I think so? Okay. If you don't, Walmart does, they're dirt cheap. <laughs> yeah, they're like a dollar and a dollar. Okay. They, might even have a compass at Walmart. They usually do. They're usually not the great. Greatest. This one's a pretty nice one. If you don't have a compass, I have a solution for you. Are you ready? Upside down glass. All you need is a piece of transparency paper, of which you now own. And a stick pin, of which I will let you borrow for the rest of the class period, but you cannot own it. <clears throat> and a pencil, which you already have. Okay, so here's how this works. So you take your transparency paper, and you stick your stick pin through it in one spot, and you stick your stick pin through it in another spot. So we now have pen through a piece of transparency paper and a hole somewhere else. And now you take your pencil. Take your pencil, stick your stick pen on the pencil, on the paper I mean, and your pencil through the hole. is used to draw perfect arcs or circles. You see you can now accomplish such things with very cheap material. Okay. <coughs> uh, okay. So because Wiley lets you off the hook, you don't have to do any math for this. That means you have to make your drawings very precise. Because your answers will depend on the precision of your drawings. Thus, you must draw them very precisely, and the only way to accomplish such things is with these three items. Okay? Does this make sense? Okay, so, first type of thing. This one's really easy. Flat mirrors. We've already talked about this. This is really straightforward, okay? However tall your object is, that's how tall your image will be. H equals H prime. This is object, this is image. It's the same, they're the same height. Always, every time. Okay? <clears throat> However far your object is from the mirror, that's how far your image is from the mirror. Always, every time. Straight mirror, straight flat mirrors are straightforward. Okay? So you need to remember these two rules and this rule. For flat mirrors. What's that? That would be a good thing to write down. So this is an image. No, this is not an experiment. This is just this is just uh, what you need to know for this chapter. Yes. This 
this in our textbooks? What's that? Is this in our textbooks? Uh, yeah, I believe so. It should be. <coughs> Take this flat, boring mirror and bend it. Okay? So now we're going to get this. This is called a concave mirror. And we could bend it the other way, and then in case it would be a convex, convex mirror, otherwise known as fisheye. So they use fisheye mirrors in grocery stores and such to make sure that they reduce uh, theft. Because if you can't see around to the aisle from the register, you put a fish mirror up there and you can look in the mirror and see to the fish aisle. As we see a lot of aisles really easy. Okay. Everything looks smaller, but you can see lots of them. This is good for cosmetic purposes. Those people who wear makeup and such like to have a convex mirror so they can see their face up really close. Kind of scary. <laughs> um, there you go. That's what that does. Uh, but you always get an image of these. Okay? And so uh, sometimes the image is real. What does that mean? Looks like you. Yeah, it looks. It's what, yeah. They always look like the object. It reflects the real world. Say again? It reflects the real world. Like you see the image. It reflects something that could be put on a screen. So a real image is something that if you put a screen there, you would see the image. It actually would be there. Okay? Okay, so that's the first type of image. There's another type of image that's called imaginary image. And that's the kind of image that looks like it's there, but it's not. Okay? Let me give you an example of an imaginary image. When you look at this really close, do you see you? Yeah. Is that an image? Yeah. It is not a real image. You cannot put that on a screen. That's an imaginary image. I'm totally not getting this. Let me show you. Let me show you your real image or your your imaginary image. Okay, this is an imaginary image. Okay, you see it? Is it, you see, is it there? Yes, sir. Okay, but I can't. You can't put that on the screen. Okay. Now, let me show you something else. What's that? I can put it on posters everywhere. On posters everywhere? <laughs> You'd have to draw it because you can't project it. Okay, that, for the camera's sake, is an imaginary image. It cannot be put onto a screen. Let me show you a real image, okay? Um, let's see, I hope I can do this. You see those light bulbs up there? You stand on the stool. Not a rolly stool. <laughs> ceiling. I notice it's only focused at one spot. Here it's not focused at all. There it's only kind of focused. There it's not focused at all. Do you all see that? There, right there. Kind of focused. Why do I say kind of focused? Because it's clear. Because over here on the edges it's really fuzzy. And those two light bulbs, why do I see two light bulbs? There's only one up here. Was this? Concave. Concave spherical mirror. Spherical mirrors never give you good images. They give you kind of good images. <clears throat> Parabolic mirrors would give you really bad images. This is why when you look at you, the side of you is all fuzzy. You look off over to the edges, yeah. you're all fuzzy over there. <laughs> good thing it's imaginary, huh? <laughs> See how fuzzy you are on the sides? It's a good thing it's imaginary. So, what is the so here's all the fuzzy sides. You can see all the, can, Sarah, can you point your finger at the fuzzy sides? 
Yeah. Okay. Now, what were you saying? Well, except there's a pair ball here. Ah, good question. Okay. Uh, let me define the spherical mirror for because that's easier. Then we'll pair ball. Okay. If you draw a circle, pretend that's a perfect circle. You realize it's not. And you take that and spin it like a coin. Okay. What'd you say? It looks like one to me. Good. I like this attitude. You spin it like a coin. Okay. You know, you spin a coin on the table. That that would form a perfect sphere. Okay. And if I were to take a section of that, just this piece down here, that's the shape of that spherical mirror. Okay. It's a it's a piece of a sphere. Okay. A parabola is different. It follows a, it's a mathematical function. Is what it is. And it always. Uh, it's most fun to put it at the axis like that. It's a, I'm trying to think of the function. Y equals some number squared. You can shift it if you want. But uh, but the key is x has to be squared. Okay, so this this function and the a defines how open or closed it is. B depends on how you shift it or shift it up and down. But uh, anyway, like lines. this is it's like a line, but it's not a line. It's a yes. parabolic equation, yes. and it gives you. And if you were to take this shape and spin it, and then cut a section of that, that would be a parabolic mirror. The parabolic mirrors give you parabolic mirrors give you good images every time, right images. And notice the bottom of this looks really close to the bottom of that. So. That's why we can use a spherical mirror and get a pretty good image. So, because it's almost the same thing. Why are parabolic mirrors so expensive? Because to make a parabolic mirror is a trick. Because to get a curve on a glass, you have to grind it. Okay, this is the way you do it. Polish it and grind it. Polishing is just a fancy word for grinding. Okay, it's a smaller medium. Okay, um, and the way you accomplish grinding in rapid fashion is by spinning an object. And every time you spin an object, we tend to get circular shapes. And so this is why it's much easier to make a spherical mirror than a parabolic mirror. So how do you make a parabolic mirror? Uh, <coughs> best parabolic mirrors? You're going to love this answer, kind of. The best pair of parabolic mirrors are not solid. The best parabolic mirrors are made out of mercury. And it's put in a giant bowl, and the bowl is spun at a very controlled rate. And as you spin it, that mercury tends to move out to the outer edges, and the amount that it moves out to the other edges just very precisely forms an exact parabolic shape. Then how do you keep it that way? You have to spin it at a very constant rate. And so, like a telescope, a bowl of mercury or something? Bowl of spinning mercury. Wow, it's yeah. pretty cool stuff. Uh, the way that now, so you can do that. Now the problem with a bowl of spinning mercury is that you can't ever tip your bowl, <laughs> and so you can only look at the stars straight above you, which has its usefulness because all the stars rotate above you, and so at every night of the year you see a different set of stars anyway. So it's it's pretty functional actually, but you can't control it. The other way to get a bowl, a perfect spherical, perfect parabolic mirror that you can tip. To have to make it out of glass, and you do the same trick. You get molten glass, get it really hot so it's liquid, and spin it, and then let it cool slowly in the oven while it's spinning. When you get done, then you let it. When it's cold, when it's cold, you have a parabolic piece of glass that you coat it with silver. That's an expensive. Right? That's why I'm saying it's an expensive process. Where's the mercury? Oh well, uh, you have to jump through lots of hoops to get mercury. The EPA frowns on mercury. Okay, so there we go. Total side on mirrors. Uh, this is your fault. Uh, we're running out of time rapidly. We jump to concave mirrors. And although, um, okay, so this is a concave mirror. And I, uh, yep, so this is a concave mirror. If you were to send in parallel beams of light, 
and this were perfectly parabolic, then all the beams of light would intersect at that point. Okay, the way they reflect. Now remember, when it hits here, it just reflects back according to this law. Every time. We're just talking about a mirror. So it's just reflection, angle in equals angle out every time. Okay? It's just that the angle of the mirror is changing. Okay? So when it's here, a straight beam of light hits this and bounces straight back and goes through that point. When it's over here, a straight beam of light hits this and bounces that way and goes through that point. Okay? Does this kind of make sense? Okay, so at that point could be called. Any ideas? The focused point. It's a focal point. It's exactly. the focal point uh, parallel to the outside edges. This is a trick question. And I will answer that. It's a very good question. We are going to, at this point, assume spherical mirrors. Why? Because, as we just explained, spherical mirrors are really close to parabolic mirrors. Okay? And spherical mirrors are so much easier to talk about. Mathematically, they're easy. Okay? This, not mathematically easy. We will not use these in this class. But we're going to assume that this and this are the same thing. Okay? So, <laughs> if this were a sphere, and we can see from the picture that it's not, why? It's only hard. Because we have very focused focus point. Okay. If this were a sphere, then the focal point would be exactly half of the radius. And you say, what is the radius? Well, if we have a circle, then the middle, the exact middle of that circle, well, any distance from this point to the edge is the radius, right? And if we draw a line through it, and there's my center of my circle, then this here is the radius, and the focal point is exactly between those two. Exactly between them. The radius divided by two. That works very well for spherical mirrors. Okay? Yes, sir. And, <clears throat> and if we take just a small piece of our spherical mirror, or just a small piece of our parabolic mirror, eh, they're pretty close, and we can say this is approximately true. So, approximately, we're going to call it exactly true. Okay? Yes, sir. And actually, the math works out really nice this way. Does this make sense to y'all? Okay. Now here's the rules. We need these rules for the homework. Ray tracing rules. These are so important. Rule number one. And I'm going to show you this as we go. Okay. Does he have this in the book? Um, not as clear as this. Could you send us the slide then? Yes. Okay. This is where your ruler must be used. Okay. I don't have one here, so I'm going to draw it using my imaginary ruler. Y'all ready for this? That is my optical axis. How do you draw an optical axis? You just draw a line. Okay, it's very straightforward. You okay with this? Is it through the middle? Wherever you want to be shining your light. Yes. Okay. Step number two, draw the mirror using the optical axis as a radial. Okay, now what does that mean? Big fancy words. Big fancy words. Here's what that means. That means you take your compass, and it's got a pointy end and a drawing end. Okay? You put your pointy end on the line. Okay? And you draw your circle. That ensures that the center of your circle is on the line, on the optical axis. Okay. With your um, pin and transparency paper version, 
You put your pen. Put your pen on the line. Okay. And then draw your circle around. Yes, sir. Okay. Does this make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Until I get home. Until you get home. <laughs> okay. So at that point, so you'll have your center point marked. How will you know your center point? You just decide. Yeah, you just decide where it is. But once you've set it, you will know where it is because you'll have a hole there because that's where your pin was. Either the pin from your paper or the pin from your compass. Okay, you'll have a hole there. That will be the center of your circle. Okay, and you'll have a curve over here. And you don't have to draw the whole circle, just a piece, whatever, if that's the mirror. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, and now you know the radius. And notice what this does. This assume that this radius right here is one of the optical, what is the optical axis. Okay. So this is this this makes it so that the optical axis is one of the radius of your circle. Okay? Are you following this so far? I'm not certain. Key point. Your pin's gotta go there. Yes. If, if you do that you got it. Yes. Okay, then you'll draw that makes you draw a circle over here. Okay? Now that you know that, you measure this distance, divide it by two, now you know the focal point. Okay? Does this make sense? Okay? <clears throat> so you find the radius, i.e., you measure it. How do you measure it? You get your ruler. You've got to use your ruler. There's no way around it. You've got to use your ruler. Okay? <clears throat> and then how do you find the focal point? Take your radius, type it in your calculator, divide by two, that's your answer. Maximize the precision of your ruler. Okay? Uh-oh. Step four, we're flying through this. Draw your object. Okay. Uh, here's how I like to draw my objects. I, I, I have a vast array of objects that I like to draw. They are usually either an arrow pointing up or a candle because those are two things that I can draw pretty well. So I'll draw a candle for you this time. You are not limited to these two objects. I just like these because they're easy to work with. Okay. Can I draw an elephant? If you want to, you are welcome to do so. Okay. You good so far? You draw an object. Wherever the problem tells you to draw your object, okay, and it will tell you a certain location. Okay. And then you have to draw three of the four known lines. Okay, here's your four. I'm going to describe all four of these two. Okay, it doesn't matter which three you take, but you've got to draw three of them. Okay, you ready? And some problems, some of them are harder than others, which is why. Okay, parallel to the optical axis. Okay, so here's what that means. That means you take, and I'll use green and this. Green incoming, orange outgoing. Okay. Parallel to the optical axis. What does that mean? Uh, parallel to the optical axis. Right? Okay. So it's going to go in parallel. Now, how do you draw a straight line like this? You got to use your. How do you make sure it's parallel? Um, Eyeball. No. <laughs> you can measure this distance whatever that is, and then you measure it down here somewhere. Mark out that same height. Anywhere down there, that doesn't matter. Then that gives you that height. Okay? Yes, sir. Does this make sense? Yes, sir. And that'll give you a few points to find a line, right? One, two. Okay? Now, remember that picture I showed you? <clears throat> if the light comes in parallel to the optics, to the optical axis, where will it reflect to? Focal point. It will go to the focal point. Aha! Now you know where this one goes. So you now take your ruler and you lay it across here so it goes from here to here and you draw that line. So here's your ingoing. And oh, I told you I was going to get more Okay. Does this make
make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, that's one of the three, one of the four known lines. Known line number two, through the focal point. Okay? So that means you draw a line from here through here. So it's going to go in like this. Get your mirror, and where's it going to go? Focal. No. It's yeah. going to come back parallel. Remember, this is a radius of my curve. And at any point on the circle, perpendicular, the radius and the surface are always perpendicular. So this is straight in, straight out every time. Okay? That's your known line number three. Alright. Line number four. To the optical axis, optical axis mirror intersection. Where does the optical axis and the mirror intersect? Okay. So line number four. the answer. Where all of these lines intersect, that's where your image is. This is beautiful. See that? They all intersected right there, except for one. This one didn't intersect there, probably because I'm a horrible artist and I did not use a protractor or a ruler or a compass. I just eyeballed the whole thing. Okay. But if I had used my protractor or my ruler in my compass, I would have gotten all of them to intersect at the same point. And I would now have an image right there. And that image, that point, since all this originated from the top of my candle, that's where the top of the image would be. Okay. There you go. That's how to do ray tracing for a mirror. You'll have to do ray tracing for a lens also. We'll do that next week. Instructions are almost identical to this. Yes. We <coughs> didn't get to play with the laser toy today. I'm already seven minutes over. Okay. Don't worry, we'll save it for next week. Okay. So when do you want to practice problems to you? I still need to do the practice problems to do as much as you can. Um, the mirrors is going to be half of the half of the, the lens so the other half. Yes. And so, you want us to be as precise with that one as well? I'll send you, let's see, uh, oh, yeah, there's a nice example. Parallel to the optical axis, to the focal point, to the focal point, parallel, and to the center, back and back. That'll intersect with a nice point right there. Yes, sir. Okay. 
So that's kind of what I want you to accomplish here. And the reason that one's upside down is because all the uh, thingies, the, all the intersections happen below the optimal lines. Yes, sir. Well, the key point, if your image is upside down, it is real. Every time. If your image is upside down, it is real. It can't be projection onto the screen. Yes. Okay. Does this make sense? We'll talk about that next week. Yes. Okay. Uh, see you all next week. Yes. Thank you very much.